Steve is visiting us from the Sonoma Point Country Turners Club. Uh, Carl put me on him, Carl um, Saul, and uh, he's a member of that club and this one. And so Steve was gracious enough to come down here and give us a, a demonstration today on his techniques for photography. And Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. And I appreciate you, um, you know, having me come on in. So, um, I'm not going to make you a professional photographer. I'm not a professional photographer. I don't have any pretension towards that. If any of you are professional photographers, please accept my apologies for what I'm going to do today. Um, if I can do this, you can do this. That's my point, is that what the stuff I'm going to show you is accessible. It's manageable. You don't have to be a pro. You don't have to devote thousands and thousands of dollars to get good quality photos. I don't know that you would say my photos are pro level, but they are pretty darn good, I, I will say that. Um, so, um, you know, I'm not trying to make you into any one kind of photographer. I'm trying to give you the, the kind of the concepts and a basic orientation so that you can get the photos that you want that, that will match your goals. Um, and to help you think about your goals as well. Also talk, going to talk a little bit about basic workflow and pr the, the process that I use. Um, again, I don't expect you to go home and instantly become some, some you know, renowned photographer, but hopefully you can go home and implement the steps that would get your photography to the point you want to get at. I will also say it's, it's taken me a while to get there. Um, my son, is a very uh, uh, exacting critic. And I, I started off with stuff that was okay, and he pushed me and pushed me and pushed me, and, and that's part of how I got to where I am. Just like with the wood turning. You know, expect to spend some time, expect to throw some stuff away before you get to where you wanna be. You're not gonna get there in one step, it's a journey, okay? Um, I'm not going to turn you into, into a pro. I'm not going to pretend that I'm a pro. Um, I'm not selling anything. You can do this with virtually no expense all the way up to spending big bucks. I did this with a modicum of expense, and you can too. Um, and, I, and I also don't expect you to, to want to take the photos that I want to take. My goal is to help you think about what are the photos that you want to take so you can take them. Okay, um, Jim was mentioning, oh, yeah, see. Steve, I think we should put a mic on if Fair you don't enough. mind. If so I'm not projecting enough, that's fine. Yeah, okay. So, another drill. And turn it on, and put this to your project. Okay, is that better? Okay. okay, sorry about that, I thought I was projecting plenty. Okay. Hey Dave, it's probably a little too loud. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. Okay, so, um, am I in, do I need to adjust where I am, or is that okay? Okay, I didn't want any feedback. Um, Jim was talking about the design class that's coming up. If you guys, and Cindy was talking about the library. If you haven't looked at Raffin's wood turning, wooden bowl design, I forget the exact title of it. That's the Bible for, for design. And really, I mean, I've been spending 20 years thinking about those ideas. You don't have to turn any one style of bowl, but if you don't learn how to think about design, your designs are going to be poor. Um, same thing with the photography. You don't have to shoot a certain, any one style, but it's really good to know what the, what the um, principles of design are, what the principles of good photography are, so that you can then manipulate it to get what you want. So, um, you can have better pictures, and I hope that you walk out of here with at least one new idea that you didn't have before. Some of you may already be taking great pictures, but hopefully you'll come away with, oh, I didn't think about that thing. Um, and you can do it cheaply. All this, all this stuff that I have here, except for the camera, a couple hundred bucks. It's not pro level, a pro would laugh at me, but I'm getting good pictures with just a very modest investment. Okay. Um, your work, some of you know, just looking at the table here, there's a range of styles in the work that you do, and the same thing is true for your for your photography. A lot of it comes down to 
not the work itself, but the lighting and the background, the, the, the posing of the work is going to uh, determine how that photo comes across. Um, if I came in here today, I mean, I could be a great pro photographer, but if I came in here and I had stains on my shirts and my fly was undone and everything, it kind of wouldn't really matter what I had to say. You'd look at me and think, I don't know, trust that guy. Yeah, my wife. Yeah. Right here. Right. Right. Um, you know, presentation matters, and a lot of good photography is good presentation. And you want the presentation to be harmonious with the work itself. If you're turning wild, you know, uh, live edge pieces, do you want to pose that like it was in a museum, or do you want to pose that in, in a way where um, where the shadows and the, the texture are going to be emphasized? I mean, the, there's things you can do to harmonize, to emphasize the key qualities of the work. So that's my hope in, in what I'm going to show you here. Um, let's see. So what I did here, I, you know, I, we can, I have these individual photos that we can look at one at a time later. But I want you, know, as you look at these, I just went to the AAW website and just copied down photos that I thought were illustrative of one or another uh, principle or issue in photography. And as you look at these, what's, you know, think for yourself, what's your eye drawn to? What do you notice about any of these photos? And, and you know, like, hands up, like, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing, like, what jumps out at you from, from this array? Cindy? The, uh, the lighting and the fact that none of them are shot against the <coughs> background. And you can see the shadows. Okay, so you're noticing that, like, for instance, this one, there, there are some pronounced shadows here. You might have heard, like, oh, you're supposed to get rid of the shadows. Well, <coughs> no, you don't have to get rid of the shadows. Uh -huh. Right? You can, but is this person getting what they want out of, out of their fo photo with the shadow? What's something else that you notice? Cindy said no backgrounds. No uh, white. No real white. Oh, no, no white background. Uh-huh. Ah, okay. Yeah, this one's pretty, pretty flat right here, right? The, the, there's not, I mean, I don't know what color it is exactly, but it presents as a white background, right. right? But in general, no, you're noticing that there's, the background itself has some gradation within it, doesn't it? Uh -huh. They fill the space. Ah, they're, they're filling the space. To the edge? No. 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 Right. So you've got, you know, the, there's an issue of margins that we need to look at. Okay. The one's truncated. Which one is truncated? Top right. Yeah. Top right. Oh, that I, that was this. I couldn't fit it in the. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. That that photo was actually, you know, evenly spaced. So my, that's just an art, an artifact for me. Sorry about that. The bottom right. Ah, uh, the bottom right. So they didn't show the whole thing. Right. You don't, you don't have to show the whole thing. What's your goal? What are you trying to emphasize? That's a fo that photo isn't about the entire piece. That photo is a detail. Of the top. They're drawing your attention to something in particular rather than to the entire form. Right? What else, Cindy? You Most of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, the distance at the top from the top of the object is greater than the distance from the bottom of the object. So they're not placed, they're not centered per se. They're centered sideways, but not top to bottom. Okay, and we're gonna look at that, the positioning within the frame, okay? So just on this very brief little survey, we can see like there's a huge range of possibilities, okay? There's also some things in here that we'll look at that I think are problematic as well. And we'll look at things that maybe people could be doing better well, with their photography. And my goal is not to hack apart any one of these, these turners or any of you. You may know some of these people for all I know. Literally, <laughs> it's a small community. So my goal is not to personalize or, or anything like that. It's the, the goal of all critiquing, which is to, what can we do to improve the work? Okay, so. 
Um, if you're going to get good photos, you need to understand, a, you know, this is not going to be a big technical workshop. I'm not going to be taking photos, I'm, but I want to introduce the ideas that you're going to need. There's, there's a recording medium. It used to be film, right, with molecules, silver halide molecules and everything. And those reacted to light. Well, now it's electronic, right? You've got that sensor, and I don't even know what, what that is how that works or anything, but you've got the light hitting it and little electrons are jumping around and that's how you're recording the image. To do that, you need enough light. Whatever enough is, is, a, is variable depending on the sensor and the size and all the rest of the electronics, but you need enough light. That's the basic underlying piece for photography. Um, the amount of light itself is dependent on three core variables. Okay, the, the, the sensitivity of the sensor, and that's something that can be dialed up or down. That's called ISO, and when we were shooting film, it was ASA. Mm -hmm. It's the same basic factor. How much light is this thing, does this thing need to even get the electrons going? The width of the opening, the aperture, all, you know, think of the iris of your eye, that's the aperture in the lens. It, it's the opening that, that's getting smaller or larger. And the third thing that, that, that uh, controls how much light is, is needed on that sensor is the duration. You've got separate from the aperture. The aperture isn't doing this. You have, well, it could be, but you have how long is that aperture open or there's a, 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 sh um, a, a, door. a shutter, a door over it that opens and closes, right? How long is it being exposed for? How much is being let in? and then how much does it need to trigger the, the sensor. Now, you may be thinking, so what, right? I, I mean, if it's open for a long time or a short time or, or the thing is wide or narrow, like you, you, it's three different ways to modify the light, but so what? The issue is, it's not just um, those three factors, ISO, shutter speed, and aperture don't just modify the amount of light, they modify the quality of the image. And so that, that does then start to matter, how are you gonna control those? So I just copied this off the internet. This is an image of apertures, right? And they're recorded in f-stops. And this goes way back to the beginning of photography and I don't, I don't remember or even knew all of that stuff. But the basic idea here is, as the, you know, as the aperture gets wider, it's letting in more light. The trade-off is that as it gets wider, it has a narrower depth of field. Okay? So the stuff that's in the background gets blurry. The stuff that's in the foreground gets blurry. And you have a narrow plane of, the, of what's in focus. And you can, you can dial this up so that somebody, the tip of their nose can be in focus and their eyes can be out of focus. That, the, that plane of focus can be that narrow depending on how you manipulate these variables. In the other direction, if you've got a little tiny F32, just a little pin, pinprick of, a, of an iris, of an aperture, you get maximal depth of field. That's when you're taking the shots outdoors and you've got the mountains and the person in the front and everything's in focus. Okay, so you can see, now is there a right way to, to set the aperture? Yeah. Depends on the piece. Do you want to be emphasizing some little detail and have everything else out of focus? Then you're going to want to be able to go to a really wide aperture. Do you want that whole piece to be in focus? Then you want to work with the, the smallest aperture you can get. So there's choices and image quality in those choices. That's aperture. Shutter speed, we're not shooting sports, so this is much less relevant for us. I used to teach yearbook, and I had to, you know, depending on the shutter speed, you had an image that was blurry or not blurry. These are not going to be blurry images. So, so this really gives us a lot, of, a lot of flexibility. We can get the aperture we want because we can just dial the, the, the shutter speed up or down. ISO, that has medium significance. With low sensitivity, you need a lot of light to get a good image. With high sensitivity, 
You don't need very much light to get a good image. But the trade-off is you get what's called noise, what used to be called grain when we were shooting on film. With grain, it was literally grains of silver halide would come together differently depending on the sensitivity of the film. Now it's, it's this electronic version of grain called noise. Probably you want the finest grained shot you can get, the, the, the least amount of noise possible, in which case you want to be shooting. Most cameras that I've seen have enough, the lowest ISO is 100, okay? So unless you're specifically going for that grainy look, you probably are going to be dialing in, setting your camera to an ISO of 100, you're probably, you probably want the whole thing to be in focus, so you're probably going to want an f-stop down around 22 or 32, and then you're going to let the shutter speed float to get what you want. I have shot like six second, eight second shutter speeds. So what? Doesn't matter. A photographer might scoff at that, a pro might scoff at that, but I'm getting good shots just using the basic principles. I know I want it fine, I know I want good depth of field, I'll let the shutter speed float. There's an, uh, this is just another graphic, kind of, you know, think of it as a triangle, and you've got these three points of the triangle to balance it, to get, to get an adequate exposure that, um, that you want. Let me see here. Okay, so this is all just technical stuff, principles of, of getting a good shot. You want to optimize the key factors. So the key factors in your case are grain and depth of field. The shutter speed is not so, is not so critical for us. If you're shooting these, uh, how many of you still shoot film? That's what I thought. Okay, so we're, we're only talking about, about digital photography at this point. Um, the difference between RAW and JPEG can be the difference between uh, an image that you can really precisely tweak and one where you have not as, not as much of a range for sort of perfecting it after you've shot it, okay? Um, RAW files are much bigger. You, you gotta have enough storage space in your computer to be able to work with RAW files and you're gonna need to learn a little bit more to work with raw files. But if you really want to go for high quality imaging, you probably should be shooting raw, or you can shoot both simultaneously, depending on you know, kind of how you're going to use, this, use the stuff. Um, white balance is important, and I want to show you that. We think of light as, having a, uh, as being white, but actually white has color, color range to it. Now, it may be that everybody in here already knows this, I'm just not taking anything for granted. I'm just covering the basics here. Just, just making sure that we're all on the same page. Um, the stuff in your house probably is around 2700. And you think of that warm light in front of the fireplace, you know, in the living room. And you can see it from when you're outside at night. And it has that kind of very almost orange-yellow glow, okay? As compared to, like, when you're outside, you know, that's a much higher... It's, the, the degrees are the Kelvin scale, and up around 5,000 and up is kind of daylight out, outdoors. And that's very sort of bluish white. And then you've got the kind of in between, the, depending on, the, on the, the artificial source. The critical thing isn't that you use one or the other. The critical thing is that you use only one. Mm. Blending these, if you're set up to shoot this, and you've got this light, it's going to show up as yellow. If you're set up to shoot this, but you've got this light, it's going to show up as really blue. So the thing is to just get those things to match, that whatever light source you're using, these are going to look very white. Right? Um, these are, I believe, 5200 Kelvin. Right? If I had a, a, just a regular old tungsten bulb, <coughs> this would be looking very much warm or very much yellow, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's a setting that you need to pay attention to in your camera. You need to pay attention to ISO. And I have, I can't tell you how many times I've like, kind of come in here, got ready to shoot my stuff, started shooting, and then realized I hadn't gone back in and actually 
checked my settings. Right? You've got to check your settings when you start, period. So, ISO, shutter, um, aperture, and white balance. Decide if you're shooting RAW, JPEG, or some combination. Okay? Now, the camera, I'm going to unscrew this guy here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the camera because there's just so many variations out there. And, and, I mean, you can spend a few hundred dollars and you can spend thousands of dollars. And the same thing on the lenses, too. Um, but they're going to have basically the same, the same controls. Okay? On the camera, you probably have a green button or, you know, a green setting, which is you don't need, you even need a brain. The camera's going to do all the thinking for you. Right? <laughs> then you've got... Um, Usually you've got something like A for auto or, 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 or um, P for program, which is just one, one step this side of the green button, the green setting. Then you've got aperture priority, A, or S for shutter priority. I think Nikon calls it T for time. Um, okay, one of them has T for time, and one of them has S for shutter. I can't remember which manufacturer has which, but it's the same thing where you, where you set the shutter, or you set the aperture, and then it controls, and then the other things float. And then you can do um, manual, where you set everything. And the camera has a light meter built into it, and so you can modify one or the other or both as you need to. Strongly recommend that you learn how to work with manual to get the thing you want. That's most likely going to get you where you need to be. So now if you're shooting with this, I don't know how you, you know, these take really good photos now. You don't need this. You can do it with this. But I don't know how to instruct you with this. This, they figured out how to take this and jam it in here. <laughs> Seriously. But I don't know, uh, I don't know enough about all the, the, how you control the phone in an iPhone or uh, 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 the, the other thing. But there are ways to get at a lot, most of these settings, okay? Again, the idea isn't that I show you one, one brand of camera with one set of controls. The idea is that you recognize that you can do this with whatever you have. But you need to do this with whatever you have, okay? Um, let's see, what next? Okay, this is going to sound obvious. Use a tripod, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. You know, I said, you, you're going to learn to do whatever you want to do. This is one thing where it's, it's from, you know, from God's mouth to you. Use a tripod, period. Okay? It doesn't need to be a fancy tripod. This is a cheap, cheap tripod. Um, I've had ones that were worse than this that I've abandoned. They, there's some minimal level of quality that you need. Um, but you don't need much more than the minimal level of quality for this. The thing's just got to be still, right? You've got, you know, um, ease of adjustment for the legs and everything like that. So there's lots of varieties of these things. But the main thing is use it. You, add, you want that image to be absolutely rock-solid stiff. So tripod. Um, use a remote delayed shutter release. So if you've got your phone, you know, you can... Uh, there, a lot of times you can trigger it with your phone, never even touch the camera. I've got a two-second release um, in my camera, but you, you don't want to be squeezing the camera while you're, you want to be able to trigger the shutter and then not touch it. Because there, there is, there's movement in there. So um, always a tripod, always a delayed release or, or a remote release on the tripod, uh, on the shutter. Um, you will be shocked at what will show up in your photos. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. um, the tiniest little bit of dirt that you don't even see with your 65-year-old eyes will show up like a clown face uh -huh. in your photo. I swear. It's just, it's shocking. So you really need to blow it off, dust it off, whatever you need to do to make sure there is no no little bits in there. And the same thing on the surface of the work. 
I've had work that I thought was just pristine, and I take that picture, and there's the little filaments from the buffing wheel uh -huh. all over it. And I didn't even see it with my bare eye. The photo will reveal to you what you need to clean up. So learn to clean it up first. You'll save yourself a lot of time and headache. Um, <laughs> along with that, Check the photo before you move along, right? The, the camera will let you zoom in so that you can see, are, am I in focus? Is there a blur? Is there dust in that little crevice that's going to show up when, I, when it's up on the screen, right? So you want to be, you need to be very deliberate about all of this. Um, and shoot more poses than you think you need. Just as we were looking at those, those that array, once you see those pictures, you're going to start noticing, oh, I like this one better than that one. But if you didn't shoot that one, you're not going to know that you like it better than this one. Right? You've got to shoot from a variety of, of angles. You can modify the lighting. You, you want to shoot kind of, you know, front, like the posing of the piece to get the different things. And out of all that, you might only end up using one photo. So what? I did, do we, are we supposed to use the most photos we can? You want the best photo you can. You can get out of it. You might want a series of, of for that, that shot. If you're posting stuff on a website, you might want you know, multiple, multiple views. So you're shooting to get multiple views. But mostly what you're shooting for is quality photos from whatever view. OK? All right. So again, if this is obvious, I apologize, but this is stuff that I learned the hard way. So I figured you might be learning it the hard way, too. Um, so all of this is just technical stuff. We've got a, we've, now we've got an image in the camera that we set up. We had the camera set up right, all that. But, but wait a second. Got to work backwards a little bit here. How are we going to pose it? Right? So the angle where the camera is in relation to the piece. So you've got several different planes to work in. One is high angle, neutral angle, low angle. I don't think we're much shooting low angle shots of the work. That would be kind of weird when I think about it. I, I taught film and video, and you know, a low angle image tends to make something look really big and, and imposing. That's not usually what you're going for with the work, but I suppose like some of the big sculptural pieces, maybe you do want to like, pose it on a pedestal and then get down low and shoot up at it. That could be really dramatic, right? What do you want to express with your photo? Now we're getting into the expressive quality rather than the technical quality. If you shoot um, <coughs> neutral on the horizontal plane, you're not going to see the opening. If, you know, most of these things are round in some, for, in some form. If you shoot flat across it, you won't get that sense of depth of the opening. Shooting straight on it, um, uh, in, the vertical, in the vertical plane, you, you gain something and you lose something. Okay? So we've got high, kind of you know, neutral, and low angle. But then we also have front, three quarters, or one quarter, you know, quarter view, and you can also shoot what you think of, well, well, it's a round object. There's no profile. I mean, anything, if it's from the front, in a sense, it's a profile shot, right? So the the side-to-side -side thing may not matter depending on the piece. But in relation to the lighting, then you're starting to get, that's where, where the angle is going to matter more, okay? Um, so you've got the where you the placement of the of the camera is very significant, and then the placement of the light is very significant. So you know we've got the new we've got the ambient lighting in here. So this isn't going to show up as well as as well as it might. But I want to show you guys um, several issues here. So I should take this off first. Okay. So first. You know, the first element is a single piece, of, a single bit of light. Now, if I'm just in here like this, 
That's god awful harsh, isn't it? Right? It's it's you got the the reflection and you've got this really sharp shadow and so one of the first things to notice is that direct light tends to be very kind of harsh and not very flattering. One way to diffuse it is through the booth. Now look at the shadow. It's much softer, but it's still there, and the camera will make that shadow look very sharp. Okay? So how can we diffuse that light even more? Now... It's, in fact, that light is soft enough now that the shadow is actually more from this stuff coming in. I'm getting a much more general illumination in there. When you have light coming from one side, then you've got to wonder about, well, what's happening on the other side? So, And now, and, and again, this isn't showing up great because there's a lot of variables here right now. But in general, you want a little brighter on one side than on the other. And you're going to get that 3D modeling that's really going to let your piece show up in space. Okay? This is generic kind of studio portraiture lighting. Okay? You don't have to do this. You can have a single light off to the side, breaking across it. Even a single light, not diffuse, breaking across it. And we'll look at some, some examples of, of how that can look. That can look fabulous. This is going to give you a well-lit, evenly lit, modeled, kind of one-size-fits-all, looks great shot. Then you can start playing with the elements, modifying it. All right, so we've got, we've got all that stuff in general. Oh, we haven't even talked about, um, well, two things. We haven't talked about the background. Background is critical. One of my pet beefs or peeves with the stuff that I was showing you before is when people don't pay attention to the background, okay? This piece right here was probably the best 40 or 50 bucks I've spent. Much more important than this, much more important even than the lights, <coughs> has been this background. This is, this is a product called Flowtone. It's available on Amazon, b &H Photo, like any place. The advantage of this is that it gives me depth without me having to actually have a photo studio. Real professional photographers, they've got their, their, their table that the stuff is set up on, and they've got a big backdrop that goes up to the ceiling. And they can have the light bright here and have the back of the backdrop be dark and you get all this depth from that, that change in light. I don't have that room I, and I doubt that you do either. This is a way to get that effect without needing an actual professional photo studio. This is invaluable for a certain type of photo. Okay. So I can pose this piece kind of right in here where the gradient starts to change. And this looks like the room is receding into the dark. And I've got, and, and it, because I've got the light and the dark, the piece really shows up, really pops. Then I've got the light that's going to be enough to kind of catch the rim. And so that also helps it to pop against the darker background. Okay, even a dark piece of wood, when you've got that little bit of highlight. So this thing is, is from my perspective, that's the best 50 bucks you can spend, is on that, that little bit of backdrop. Now, this was about, I don't know, probably about 60 bucks. And this is the, this is the second thing. A professional photographer is going to tell you, put your money into, into your lighting. And what I found is that the lighting can be generic, but this is the stuff that's really helping, really helped me get to better images. Now, you can do it without this. You can just have, I have um, just stands, and you can have backdrop. You can buy the paper and just roll it out. 
your situation, that might be a better solution than what I've got going here. You need space. You need, you know, you need to dedicate a space if you're going to do that. I don't have a dedicated space. I set this up on a table in my bedroom and take the photos. The lights, most of the time now I don't even use my lights because my bedroom has got windows on two sides. I set this up in there in the afternoon and I get the nicest light. I, I you know, I don't need anything different from that. Sometimes it's rainy out or whatever. Okay, then I bring out the lights. Or if I want that sort of point lighting where I want that high contrast lighting, then I bring out the lights. But you can, I, I want you to see it's a kind of mix and match thing between your environment, your situation, your budget, and the, you know, there's a range of equipment that you can use to get at this sort of basic quality photo, okay? I love this, I love this, but I could, was taking decent photos without that. This was the big step, was the flow tone background, okay? Margins and rule of thirds. Okay, so we talked a little bit about margins. Here's the rule of thirds. Um, basic design principle, Fibonacci ratio, it all boils down basically to, you know, Two to one, basically. <laughs> Rule of thirds. You can divide that frame into thirds, and a lot, most of the time, the important stuff is going to be at the intersections. That's you know, you look at Raffin's book, you know, Rule of Thirds, in terms of where's the where's the high point of the curve? If it's down at the bottom, you've got the sort of you know um, grounded feminine thing. If it's up at the top, you've got the more the masculine figure. I mean, you can think about it all the different ways you want. But the rule of thirds is sort of the underlying principle here, okay? Now with margins, you, you, what Cindy said was exactly right. In general, you're going to have the thing framed in the middle. But wait, that's not the rule of thirds. Well, you know, things are contextual. For something like this, yeah, you want the main thing to be there. But notice, this one, they did it almost identically, top and bottom. But in general, I'm shooting with a little less, a little less of a margin here, and a little more of a margin up here. Just a little extra headroom, and it's a psychological thing. It feels more open. If you do it exactly in the middle, it feels a little crowded at the top. Hopefully, you'll start noticing these things as you look at the photos. My goal is to sensitize you to these subtle differences, so that you can get what you want. Okay. And then the lens itself. Everybody knows about wide angle and telephoto. So what? This is so what? This is exaggerated, shot with a wide angle lens. And notice the level of distortion that you get. The things that are close in the middle, like really bulge out, and then things we see really quickly off to the side. Yeah, look at her arm. Yeah. It's really bizarre. Um, notice also, though, that air, you know, things are in focus pretty far back. Wide angle increases your depth of field versus telephoto, where you have this very sort of pleasing flattening of the subject, but the background is way out of focus. Now, that's a, that background's at a distance. But that effect is there even if you're just shooting with your, you know, 50 millimeter lens in front of your thing here. You can choose to back up a little bit more and get a telephoto lens and compress things in your image a little bit. That might make that piece look a little better. You can choose to go wide angle and come in a little closer and have that thing look a little more like it's opening up. Depends on the piece, right? There's not a right or wrong way which is the way that's going to be right for you. This is another example of the effect of, of um, uh, lens setting. So this is a white, you know, the, the, the beer bottle is exactly the same in the frame in each of these, right? But notice, actually, no, it's not. This one looks wider, fatter, doesn't it, than this one? Um, and notice the background. 
the, the setting. Here you can see the whole table, and this one you can just barely, and they had to change the angle to get it to fit properly, right? So each of these is, doing, is acting a little differently. Same size subject, but the lens setting does matter. Okay, so the secret to my success is the flow tone, um, and I put that in red because that's, that's been critical, the shooting tent, and then the LED um, lights. When I started, I had compact fluorescent, just in the, you know, in a few years, those got, got taken over by LEDs. The, these kits are not expensive, folks. Um, I, I brought up my, the Amazon site right before now. And I think we had a couple lights with umbrellas and tripods for, you know, I don't know, 50 or 60 bucks, something like that. It's not very expensive. Um, I'd recommend being able to do at least two or three on one side and one on the other. So getting a kit that lets, gives you that much flexibility, but you don't have to drop giant money. And you don't have to drop any money at all. You guys got those metal, the aluminum shop light, you know, with a bulb in there. Get something, clamp those on, now you got your lights. You just gotta judge, make sure you're paying attention to the white balance. You don't need to do it this way. This way makes it kind of quicker and easier. You don't need this. You can use whiteboard, foam core. You know, you can be bouncing light rather than diffusing light, okay? The, the article that I recommended, that's the one in AW and it's by Ed Kelly, talks exactly about that, about the ways you can kind of um, do it with homemade stuff as well, okay? All right, so with this in mind, let's look at those photos. Um, oh, okay, so I already, I already talked about cameras and, and the settings and that stuff. So, look at this photo, folks. Is this guy getting what he, what, what he should be getting out of this photo? Yeah. Right. Maybe. Uh, okay, so I, I, I want to encourage discussion here. So, what's working or not working with this photo? Let's put it that way. Let's make it more objective and neutral. What's working or not working? Well, the foreground is uh, sharp. The background blurs out a little bit. Um, that front edge is working for me. Uh -huh. It takes up too much of the frame. It, it, it's too narrow at the top. It's cropped too tightly. It's cropped very tightly. Yeah, it's posed very tightly. The glare distracts glare. from the piece. Uh -huh. The glare. He's got hot spots, doesn't he? Right? So that's one of those things where, remember I said like, take the picture and then look at it? Your eyes, your, your psychology compensates for stuff that the photo, the camera doesn't know how to compensate for. And the photo will reveal to you, oh shoot, I gotta, I gotta take care of that, right? And how, how you take care of that, John Cobb said something funny about posing round, shiny objects in bright lights. It's, you know, that's an issue. That's why you want that light to be diffused, folks. Mm -hmm. When you have that sharp point light, this is more likely to happen. Okay? So, so now you start getting into like, this is why I'm not actually taking photos and showing you, because every shot, there's a subtlety that you gotta pay attention to. I'm trying to sensitize you to being able to view your own photos. This, these hot spots are an issue. Um, if, if you are, are able to see this closely enough, he's in focus right across the middle this is out of focus. This is out of focus. So his, his, his actual depth of field is too narrow. To sh I, I don't think he wants this out of focus here. I think he just didn't look at the photo carefully enough. What else? Have you ever used that Helicon software? No, I don't know about that. It, uh, if your camera is hooked up to your laptop, the software will fire 30 photos with a half inch change in focus uh -huh. and the computer paste them all into one perfect photo. There you go. There's stuff out there, like I said, I'm not a professional photographer. I'm just some Joe Blow trying to get nice pictures for my website. Seriously, like <coughs> the sky's the limit. There's all kinds of stuff out there that can, that can compensate for all kinds of errors. Go learn about it. 
You know, I'm showing you basics here. But with these basics, you can get good, good quality results. I think, you know, I, I get it, right? He's trying to show scale, because otherwise you have no idea how big the piece is. But I find this <coughs> really distracting. Mm -hmm. Also, the background. <laughs> you want to think like, oh, just a nice soft cough. Well, that cough ends up looking kind of shiny, and he's got the, the sort of wavy thing. I know he's going for sort of soft and diffuse, it's but it's, it's, it's the opposite. And it's not cloth. It's, it's, it looks like a bubble, um, bubble. Remember I said cell, closed cell phone. Remember I said you're gonna you're gonna see every little flaw in your work. You're also gonna see every little flaw in the background, in, in, in the, the the surface. This to me, I I, I have a problem with the, the with this guy's photography. Okay. So not to personalize it, but this approach, I think, is very problematic. Okay? What do you guys think? You can't tell the piece from the background. Okay, can't tell it from the background. Does it show the piece off to best advantage? No. What is it? It's a lamp. You can't see the outside, it's too much like the inside. Well, and it's on the bottom, so is it a dying piece, or oh. I mean, it's right. not a mirror. I mean, I feel it's, like there's something going on on the bottom of the piece, but you can't really tell, you know? Yeah. You need some more fill to get the outside. So there, there's something understandable here, which is it's a lamp. Let's show how pretty it is with the light sort of coming out through the holes, right? That's like, yeah, let's figure out how to show that. And then he's got, I, I have no problem with this, you know, the, the effect of this lamp on the backdrop, I think that's yeah. that works nicely. But this is a little it's distracting, isn't it? And also the point was made about now there's too big of a margin. There's not enough of the of what we want to see in this. What about this one? It's pretty high, isn't it? Yeah, there's not much headroom. Other than that, I think that, see, I think this guy takes really solid photos. His backdrop is a, he do, he's not using my backdrop. He's using one of these really beautifully modeled ones that you can get at any of the photo houses. B&H has got that stuff. And he's probably got a little more room for posing it than I do. So he's still getting that sense of depth. It's very neutral, very soft, not drawing. There's no detail to draw your, to draw your, attention away from the piece. Does the piece show up well against that? No. Does he have shadow? It's very soft. Does he have modeling? Does he have three-dimensionality? I think this guy does a good job. You can't see the, the, um, the opening though, so it's only, it's only ah. the, it's a box. Right, it's a box. So it's closed. You're not going to see the opening anyway. Oh, but you wouldn't know that. that. It's just a line. Yeah. Well, the design. Okay. So, you, you know, again, not. I don't know that this is right or wrong. He sh so when when you don't show the opening, what is emphasized? Shape. The pure form. That's right. Just the the the, the pure shape of it. <clears throat> Excellent. What do you guys think about this one? I like that. It complements the background, complements the piece. <laughs> he's well, sure looks to me like he's using the flow tone, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. It works well. Do we have enough? Do we have enough headroom? Yeah. 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 Got enough headroom. A little tight, maybe on the sides. Yeah. Maybe the whole thing could have been a little smaller in in, in the frame. Are we are we okay with the shadow? Yeah. Yeah. It works on that. It sort of it, it sort of complements. Uh, it emphasizes the shape that we've got there, doesn't it? We've got that big hot spot right in the middle of it. Yeah, that's tough, isn't it? John Cobb, where are you, John? He's in the meeting. Okay, John Cobb, well, Cobb well we were talking before, he's, he actually said, um, you know, bright, shiny objects. Oh, no, he asked me, what's your, your go-to uh, uh, sort of gloss mirror finish? 
And I said, I don't have a go-to mirror. I, I, don't, I don't do that kind of finish, no. for the, partly for this reason. It's so hard. It's so unforgiving. If you've got a flaw in there, it will show. Right. And it's hard to photograph, too. So I don't often do super glassy stuff. I have a couple pieces, and they're just a pain to photograph. So um, again, it's just flat, even right across the, we don't have, we're not seeing the three quarter view of this piece, are we? We're just seeing the pure profile of it. I, I was thinking that as a counterpoint to that, I mean, I mean, that's probably a little too hot, but having some of that does emphasize the shape because the, the angle that you're shooting that, it's, it's, if you got it too flat lighting wise, you couldn't really tell how right. round it is. Right, you need, you need some variation in lighting to, to get three dimensionality, right? But we got the hot spot. Like, how can we get that without the hot spot? That's the pup. That's the. He's got it on the side. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll fix it. The thing is, because these are round, <clears throat> wherever you put that light, you're still going to see that reflection. So how can you how can you neutralize that reflection? Even with a diffuser, you filter your light. Yeah. Even so, you're still that that may actually that looks to me like he probably had a soft box already. Yeah. So do you move it farther away, but then do you have enough illumination? So I, I'm not offering an easy, simple solution to this. I'm saying this is something you need to look for, and you're going to need to figure out your solution. But what you don't want is to end up with something where people go, God, I'm just seeing that glare. In this situation, I cheat. I put on a single coat of finish, do my photo photography, and then the extra coat. And it really, really makes life a whole lot easier. Take it from the pros. Uh, also on that picture. Oh, sorry. I'll go back one. Um, the butt face reflects up onto the piece about halfway. Yeah. That's the piece of that's what glares at me. Yes. Right. That's another thing that it's very difficult to. I don't. Maybe a pro has got a better, or maybe you need like a darker base so that it doesn't reflect as much light up. I, I don't know the answer to this. These are issues that I struggle with in my own photography, for sure. And, and you, I try to get to the happy medium or where it just seems like it's, it's not going to be what people notice psychologically. If the bottom were moved up, you wouldn't get such a glare on the bottom as well as the hot spot. Uh -huh. But it also lets people know that it's a high gloss finish. Yeah. What's your goal? Right? So that, again, there's no right or wrong answer. This might be exactly what he wants to show people. Right? I'm not, uh, yeah. That's a great point. A polarizer might take care of some of that. No. Yeah. Maybe. That's a good idea. But I don't know if the source is polarized enough that a polarizer would then be able to compensate for it. You never know. Yeah, that's a great idea, though. You need polarizers for your lights. Uh huh. They make them. What do you guys think? It's misplaced in the train. I heard whoops. What What are you whoopsing about? It's super tight. Yeah. Right now, that's a perfectly good turned piece, but the photo is not serving it. No, it is. It's not a good turned piece. Then. The photo is not serving it either. Well, as, you know, my, my point is, like, the issue isn't the piece. The issue is the photo of the piece. <laughs> um, what else? You've got double shadows. Double shadows, and, yeah. And the top is too narrow to the bottom. <laughs> this isn't big enough? Yeah. No. Okay. And we know this isn't big enough. Right. Right. And, and we've got the harsh shadow. And another shadow. Right. It's too shadow. Right. Probably it's just too like straight on. It's just too way. flat across and the top. Like it's yeah. like looks like something's missing. You right. Can, right. So if you raise that camera up a little bit and you we can see the opening, now all of a sudden we've got a three dimensional piece. This thing looks like it's two dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. You also have tungsten on the left side and top and daylight on the right. You've got right. It's the light is different colors. Yeah. Uh huh. Very good. Okay, so good. This is good. People are seeing stuff. Yep. Um, I would also like to point out that the backdrop, there's no sense of depth. And between the, between the angle that he shot it at, the light, and the backdrop, everything just turned this into a pancake uh -huh. instead of a bowl. 
Nice contrast, isn't it? This is somebody who's in control of their photography. And, you know, I heard the whistle, I heard the... Mm -hmm. I, it's just so obvious now. Now that we've been looking at some of the weaker pieces, and then when somebody nails it, right? Plenty of margin, but not so, not too much. We've got that, we've got the, we just move the camera up just a little bit is all it took to get this. We've got this lovely focus right on the front surface. You can see the pores of the wood, and there's no flaws. There's no obvious reflection. We're seeing the beautiful textural quality of that smooth wood. You can also see the angle of the top, which is really nice. Yes. Not just open, but you can see that they angled it down. Exactly. No, and we've got the, we've got the, this is actually cloth, but it's not at all distracting, is it? And we've got the background in the uh, blurry. This is actually very narrow depth of field, but it's working. This, the softening, you know, between the front lip and the back lip, we're way out of focus on the back lip. But it works beautifully, doesn't it? Yeah. So one thing that's nice about this is that there's just a little bit of a backlight on it. So uh -huh. you get that little highlight on the rim on the foreground? Yep, right along here. So you get really good separation on there? Great point. And notice the, the, the highlight on the lip against the, dark, the shadowed part back there. That contrast is what draws your eye. Contrast, well-used contrast, is what you're looking for in your photos. Uh, I think the rotation too is the way it's placed. This is nice, having this beautiful little shimmer in the grain, right. not right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Now we've got more or less rule of thirds within the piece, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> what do you guys think? No. Too tight shadows are really distracting. It and it's super tight, right? Now this wasn't like a pro photo, this was a guy who just turned some spheres and wanted to show them off on the website, which is fine. So what's your goal, right? You know, he's not going for museum quality presentation here. He was just wanting to show what he'd been working on, right? So you don't have to do all this stuff for every single photo, no matter what. This is, when are you gonna do this stuff? For your website, for your application to an art show, for, you know, like, this is demonstration quality photography. This is, hey, I made some spheres. No problem, I made some spheres. But it doesn't really, one of the spheres doesn't look like a sphere. It looks like it's angular because of the shadow. Oh, this one? The top, no, the top one oh. on the right. Oh, this it looks like it comes to a point, even mm -hmm. though it may be a sphere. Uh-huh. So maybe it's still not even working that well. Yeah. And the background it competes with it, right? It's, I mean, so this shot was clearly taken like this, right? Uh -huh. Directly overhead. In general, directly overhead, on Instagram, there's top bazillions of photos where people shoot directly over the bowl so you can see the grain. Well, pretty grain, but that could be just a flat print of grain. Like, there's no sense of the object. So I, I, I want to sensitize you to why are we shooting directly straight on like that? What do you think? Working pretty well. I would say I would have brought this down just a little bit, increased that just a little bit. But beyond that, you now notice he's got kind of shadow in the middle and he's got a light on either side. Great. You don't have to do three on one side, one on the other. Try different things and see how it looks with your piece. This is nice and, and, and kind of dramatic, I think. I think the dark top for me loses, it loses some of the image. It gets a little dark back here. So this gentleman's comment about get a little light on the rim. From behind. Yeah. Well, if it had been brought down, there would have been more light. We might have seen it more, it might have hit it differently, but I think, I think the idea of you can, depending on your setup, take a light, I could put this on the table, have it coming down from here, and I'm good to go. Right? It doesn't have to be this setup. 
that make, might make it look like it's flowing less. Yeah. What do you guys think of this? Gorgeous. Perfect. It's beautiful. <laughs> now, that I don't believe that's a black and white photo. I believe that's a color photo. What's important? What's significant about this piece? The texture. So you light it to bring out the texture. Look at where the shadow is. It's off to the side. They raked that with light. You guys all know about raking light to check for sanding flaws. This is raking light to show texture. Yes. That's it. I am between the piece and then the photo of the piece. And that's, that's the effect you're going for. It's not, you're not going to be sitting there thinking, great photo. But the photo did its job of getting you to think, great piece. Now this is raking light. This is without diffusion. Look at the crispness of that shadow. Does it work? I got no problem with that photo. Now we do have a little bit of a hot spot, but given the overall appearance, it's like what you were saying, like you know, the other guy wanted it to look glossy. This is like all about the drama, right? Yeah, and the, these, these grooves that he cut get nicely accentuated by these shadows. And the foot, exactly. How would you get rid of a hot spot without you know, uh, giving up on that Christmas? If you hadn't been in your meeting, John, you would have heard me address this already. <laughs> um, the, the, the short answer to that, John, is I don't really know. I mean, until you get there and you've got whatever lights you have, we were talking about, somebody suggested, what about polarizing the light and then using a polarizing filter? Um, you know, moving distance, moving the angle slightly, diffusing it more. Um, sometimes you have to do things with like, like having one light on one zone and a different light on a different zone. You can not just light things, what about putting a, a, but you can block things. I was going to say, block block over that other light. Right? I can use this to get sort of See that, that highlight right in there, that's making a difference. That'll show up in the, in the shot in a way that you don't register it with your eye. Turn it around and use it as a reflector exactly. solve your problem. Right. So there's all sorts of, John, there's no one answer, right? It's just you got a problem solved. Yeah. Jim. It bothers me on these last several pictures we've seen and everything's so symmetrical. Uh, the shadow line is right in the center. The piece is always squared in the center. There's, there's, it, it just it's looks gross. so static. And that bothers me a lot in a lot of these pictures I've seen that everything is just, well, you know, when I use the rule of thirds, uh, we're not putting things off center, showing some drama or motion. Mm -hmm. um, with this picture right here, the hot spot, I can see one wanting to fix it, but it also shows that it's shining. Mm -hmm. And I see, uh, depending on how big the hot spot is, it may be something you don't want to get rid of because it, it illustrates some characteristic you might be interested in. But I do don't, I don't like to see the shadow cut off. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's again personal. Oh, this? Yeah. You well, want to I see would, the whole shadow? I would like to see some way to address the shadow so it's not whacked out with anything. So then you could either come back uh, with the, the lens, so or move the camera back, or go t more towards wide angle, frame this farther over, and include the whole shadow. Change the angle of the light. This is a really good point here, which is that Jim's aesthetic might or might not match this guy's aesthetic. What's most important? Is it the bowl, or is it the bowl in the setting? What are you trying to show? So again, I, I, this is great. There's no one right way to do this. This is to sensitize you to what the image might be expressing. Um, I, will want, I do want to address the, the question of centering versus not centering. For this type of photo, traditionally it's centered to make it, you know, all your attention goes to that thing. 
For more, more it is static. For more dramatic things where, where you're doing more expressive stuff, then you're moving into the thirds. Yeah, for sure. What about this one, you guys? No. Why not? The stand that it's sitting on, to me, displaces it too far to the top and takes away from the bottom of the piece because it's so dark. It's just, it's just not lit enough, is it? It's just dull and flat. Right, it needs more contrast. Right, um, and I forget. I forget if this is an Ellsworth, but I thought, well, this is interesting because I think it may be an Ellsworth, because you know you could be the biggest name in wood turning and still like that photo is not very sharp. <laughs> you know, he, I mean, his stuff in general is is you know cutting edge is wonderfully presented. I don't remember what, where I got this one or what it was from exactly, but yeah. Now Jim's point. What if this had been framed like here or here? Then it's got a whole different feel to it. Okay? Other than that, that's another one. I think that may be by the same guy as that other piece, right? Where it's all about the texture, color photo that looks black and white. I have a question about the framing. When you're talking about framing, it sounds like you're talking about moving the camera back and placing things in a different picture. Um, what I normally do that's probably wrong, but maybe you can tell me, is that I'll take a picture and then I'll change the framing by cropping it and moving it. Is that a thing that I should be thinking about differently? It, no. It's all, you can, the, it's like with uh, shutter speed and aperture. You can vary one, the other, or both. But varying one, the other, or both will give you different effects. Mm. Same thing here. You want to zoom in and crop closer but that's also going to flatten it. So you don't zoom in, you leave the lens where it was, but you move the camera forward. Or you can move the camera back, but then zoom in. I mean, you can, with depending on, and or then you can crop it in the computer afterwards. That's what I'm talking about. Right. But when you crop it in the computer afterwards, that's not going to change any of those photographic image qualities. It's only going to change the margins. Right. Yeah, that's right. Right? It will change the noise. Because you, you, you're effectively using a smaller number of pixels. Right. Right. If you've got a high quality image, that's probably not going to matter if you've been shooting raw. But if, if you've shot with a JPEG and it maybe isn't quite, quite enough resolution, you may or may not end up with, with noise. Good point. Thank you. Right? That's Yeah. Yeah. The piece itself is very dynamic. The shot with the, the shadows coming out, the, you get the shadows coming forward, that's because you got a light in the background coming across it, right? Yeah, that's very dynamic. I feel like it needs, needs more headroom. Needs a little more headroom? Okay. Come in. And there's a lot of glare in this one, but again, that's a very shiny piece, yeah. I'm, I'm trying. I know I've got you guys. I don't know how long you guys. Timing. Oh. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so one of the things you, one of the earlier pictures you had the little scrap of tile. We're talking about scale, and I think that is a um, difficult thing to, to do. Is how do you present the scale? Because that last picture that was up, that could have been like a table size cultural piece. I mean, those could be, or those could be like two inches across, and it could be tabletop. And it's really, so this, you have no idea. Is it right. something that I would place in my entryway, or is it something I'm going to put on my dining table? This is a really good point. Scale, you can't tell scale from a photo unless the photo delivers that information. I think the Scrabble tile is a very inelegant way to suggest scale. It's like putting a ruler in there. And that to me is like, that's so different from the piece itself. How can we show scale with a piece? And there, if I could go online to Instagram, I could show you some of the, like where people are, are posing things in a space where the piece is beautifully presented and you can see the scale of it in the environment. So, but that, that's a really good point. The, the issue of scale needs to, can, may need to be addressed. On my website, I just have, I list the size, you know, nine by three or whatever it is. So there's verbal information. But yeah, until you see it next to something in real life, you don't really know. 
Yeah, Jim. This is a good this is a good one right here because it looks as if the photographer decided to fill the frame as full as he could with, with the work. But the idea of scale could be illustrated by not having the, the whole frame filled. Uh, if you want to make it appear to be very small, then maybe you make it smaller. Yeah. Yeah, or you can see the edge of what an identifiably sized table. And so you get a sense of it that way. I mean, there's a variety of ways you could approach it. Again, your results may vary, right? What's your set situation, your setup, your piece, your goal? Where is this going to be displayed? That's why I'm not, I'm not trying to, be, to show you stuff with the camera. I'm trying to show you how to think about it so that when you have your photo in front of you, you can say, that's working or that's not, but not put something up that's, that's you know, counterproductive. Doesn't the grain kind of show you how to scale on that? To me, it's like kind of yeah. yeah. Well, because this is carved. Well, That's not grain. Oh, <clears throat> it's a ball. No. I don't. You don't know what kind of. That could be. These could be two inches, or those could be five inches. I mean, yeah, I don't. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I don't want to run on too long. Uh, um, where are we at in time? When do you guys need to get out of here? When is, when is it too much? Good. We're good? Yeah. Okay. All right. It's also raining outside. You don't want to go out anyway. Right. I'll go, I'll go a little more quickly because I think we're covering similar territory here. I think this, this is the cover of a book. This is important stuff, though. Okay. Really. This is the cover of a book. First of all, if you don't know about Liam Flynn, you need to know about Liam Flynn. Secondly, what's important in the work? The texture and the grain. What did the photo emphasize? <laughs> the texture and the grain. So centered because it's like you know magnificent timeless piece well yeah you want that centered right that's supposed to just be perfection right and it is thank you, god that's a good piece thank you okay texture 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 form 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 so we've got the raking light and it's given us both But this is this seems weird. This is bigger. I, I, I would have gone. I would have done it the other way. It feels a little pushed up. A little like like it's leaning up against the ceiling. It's right up there. Okay. And then nobody says you got to show the whole thing. Take a picture of the detail. Now you could have cropped. You know, maybe this was a full full frame photo, and then it got cropped. The question is, what do you actually, you know, what do you end up with at the end? They may have posed it this way, they may have cropped it this way, but not every photo has to show every bit of the piece. There's a cover of Ellsworth's book. Yeah, right. And you can see, like, that's punky wood. He didn't get that surface smooth. He got it. I mean, he 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 cut it smooth, but the wood itself, you can see the the pock marking. You can also see this wonderful curved opening and then that deep, mysterious hole in the middle, right? He's, he's not going for smooth, shiny polish here. But on the front of the book, you see the, more of the form. All right. Um, OK, a couple of rejects. So feel free to disagree, but state your case. We've already talked about this guy's thing. And we'll, you know, we've talked about the, this and the backdrop. Also, what shape is that piece? We have no idea what the actual form of that bowl is. We know it's round, and it's got a bit of a lip. And beyond that, you can't tell what the form is. And that, to me, seems weird. If you're a wood turner, you're probably interested in form. Why wouldn't your photos show it? Yeah, it's not, that's not a big bowl. No. Yeah. Or if it's a bowl. Yeah, the wood, the amazing wood is what's really showing here. Right. But it should be on a, not a wrinkled background because it sort of distracts from the... Well, it mimics the wood. Yeah. Okay, so you're making a good case here that, that especially in this, in this case... I lower the angle down a little bit. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. But that can be a problem when you're trying to show off the inside of the bowl. You can't tell if it's a concave or a convex steel. Almost an optical illusion with that one. Right. Yeah. 
This one? They're using the camera flash. Exactly. And it's too big for Don't use the camera flash, you guys. <laughs> I didn't even think to mention that before. Yeah. The camera flash is obviously one of the, the, the direction of the light is just flat right in front. Um, we've got the harsh glare in focus and everything else is out of focus. And I don't even know what I want to think about this. <laughs> right? It's just none of it's working. So question on pieces like that, because this comes up a lot in photography of round, shiny things. You said the front's in focus, the back's out of focus. How do you solve that? Stop down. You get the aperture smaller. You, you, open, you, you slow down the shutter speed so it's open for longer. You narrow the aperture so that increases the depth of field. Um, you, I, I wouldn't switch around with the ISO. I'd keep the ISO there. I mean, I, literally, I've done 10 second exposures. Why not? There's no reason not to. If you've got a tripod, but yeah, and oh, the other thing is, if you're if you're zoomed in at all, zoom out because that increases depth of field. Bring the camera away because being up close, being being close decreases depth of field. So moving away increases depth of field. So there's some simple mechanical things you can do, and there's some choices you can make as well. Yeah. So one trick I use a lot is it's called focus stacking. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking the same shot but varying the focus and post-processing you can put them back together. And I, at the very end I'm, I'm going to talk about that idea at, right at the end. That's a great point though. So I'm like, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a pro, I'm really basic. Um, Doing that, you don't have to be a pro, but you got to learn how to, you know, you got to learn your settings and learn your camera, learn your computer software, and you can do stuff like that. And that might also work for getting rid of the highlight. Can you? You're taking multiple ex multiple exposures at different at different levels of exposure, and then letting the computer stitch it together to get rid, like basically substituting the lower exposure where it's bright and the higher exposure where it's dark. So I'm not smart enough, I'm not experienced enough, I'm not skilled enough to do that. But if you are, more power to you. But that would be the way, that would be a good workaround. Sometimes F32 is just not enough. Right. I thought this one was interesting. <coughs> How did he find the background that was exactly the same as the wall of the piece? Photoshop. Shavings. You guys see glass and glass, it looks like... Space has been taken over by them. Yeah. Yeah, but I thought this was interesting because, I mean, he's got this, you know, lovely uh, locust that looks like high, high, um, high contrast, and then this nice contrast with the, the bark, but then we lose the effect because the background's almost the same thing. There's no accounting for taste either. I mean, it. No, no, I, I mean that in the positive way. Like, <laughs> seriously, uh, I, I'm not trying to say it's right or wrong, but it's it's a noteworthy feature of the photo. It's wrong. That's uh, Orange Jose's defense post that he's posted many of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this one is a trick one because this is really nice, right? I was I I decided not to like run you guys through this, but. This, I just think that's a lovely photo. Um, yeah. None of the stuff we've been talking about. That one's working. Okay, so issues. It's the three bears approach. Too much or too little and then just right. So you can have too much light, too little light, or just right. You can have too much shadow, too little shadow, or just right. You can have hot spots or, or, or you know, too deep a shadow or just right. Um, you want to avoid recognizable reflections. We were talking about seeing the bottom in that piece, but that's different from where you can actually see, where it's, you can see yourself taking the picture. <laughs> or you can see the window. Right? You need to be conscious of, of the reflection itself. Um, out of focus or, or, or kind of the wrong point of focus. Motion blur, although if you're using a tripod, you should not be getting any motion blur. 
But if you're not using a tripod, you think you've taken a crisp photo, when you look at that up close, it's blurry. Um, smudges, dirt, dust, lint, that can be on the piece, on the background, or on the lens, or on the sensor. If you keep finding, if you keep noticing smudges in your photos, you've got to check back and figure out at what level that, that problem is. Um, the car contrast can be too flat, like that one photo. It can be too harsh, like the other ones. Um, the depth can be too flat or too bulgy. So um, distracting or inappropriate background. Um, or posed in a way so that you're not seeing what's best about the piece. Right? So all of those issues add up to amateur. You know, it's, it, you can't hide it. You can't, you can't disguise amateur. It, it announces itself. And if you want your photos to invisibly present the piece to its best advantage, you need to go beyond amateur. Fix it in post, okay? That's a famous line from, you know, kind of filmmaking. Um, so, here's what I do. First of all, I, I gotta stay organized. So I've got folders, and, and the folders are named, and I've got my wood turning photos, and then I've got, um, I, I used to just do it by year, and then by month, but now I've switched to bowls, vessels, platters, you know, I've got them by type, and then within that, uh, the pieces are labeled by year, so, oh, and by species. So, I mean, I've taken a lot of photos over the last five years. Yeah? So what software are you using? Okay, so for the basic thing of the folder system, that doesn't matter. It's whatever you've got on well, So here's a, here's a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, rather than doing photos with folders, uh, using keywords is a much uh, better approach because you have a lot more flexibility and uh, you can do a lot more searches mm -hmm. rather than tied to a folder. Because um, then you're looking for the 1993 folder of acacia bowls versus acacia bowls. Well, I don't know, my searching is I, I can get to acacia bowls really quickly and, and within that, and I, a lot of times I've got the actual name, like the individual pieces are named so that um, I can search it, or at least to my purposes, well enough. Um, so, so using uh, Photoshop or Elements or Lightroom, you can uh, meditate, even metadata. In, uh, in your camera, you can add keywords, and that becomes a much better way than organizing by folders. It's really a 1990s approach. Sorry, We're trying to stand out. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Um, like I said, I'm an amateur. <laughs> that I, I, you know, I will. Um, that would be a much a, a good step up, for sure. Um, ensure your photos are backed up. Okay, you never know when that computer's going to die. Okay, um, if you're working with RAW, then that you know that's going to give you more flexibility for adjusting. Hopefully, you're getting good quality photos to begin with, and just doing minor tweaks. But you may need to do more than that. RAW gives you that that ability. I I open in RAW. I okay. So I just got this camera. Okay, I just got a new computer. I had Photoshop, now I don't have Photoshop, so I've got to figure out what software I'm going to use going forward. I had a Canon, now I've got an Olympus, so I've got to learn this camera. It's not dependent on the, the specific tech that you have. You need to learn the tech that, that you have, and you have, and I should have. Um, I, I do, yeah? You use the term raw, have you? I was out of the room for a few minutes. Did you explain what you meant by raw, what raw is? No, I did not. Okay, the difference between RAW and JPEG, RAW is all of the information that the camera has captured. JPEG is processed information that the camera has captured. The JPEG is, is whatever their algorithms, it's boiled it down and reduced the file size. The advantage is it's boiled it down and reduced the file size. The disadvantage is you have fewer creative options or corrective options if you're going into that. That's the basic difference. Well, you, uh, I mean, I have a process for color correction, but maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, how you uh, correct the color issues in RAW or post-processing. Okay. I, I actually don't want to do that for two reasons. Okay. One is because I'm a trained monkey, and my son, I, I kind of got started. I, I know a couple buttons that I push. I've, I've settled on a thing, and so I've kind of, I haven't thought about it in a while because I'm getting good results 
with the buttons that I've got. Um, <laughs> the other reason is because the software is, I, I, I don't want to be talking about, okay, so you open it up and then you move the slider to 13. I, I, in, at this level, I just want to note that these are things to pay attention to that you, you will likely want to do. Okay. Here's, here's a quick tip. If I could. Yeah. You have a grayscale graduated on your backdrop. If you take a photo of that as the first thing, um, Lightroom, Photoshop all has a, a, an eyedropper that will instantly correct the color from 99% um, off that one shot. And then you just apply it to all the others. Excellent. But, you know, wow. You just learned something really valuable, as did I. <laughs> so there's a, a Macbeth card that actually serves as something similar. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so Steve, beyond the yeah, just um, also I, I don't know. I was out of the room quite a bit too, but you mentioned Photoshop a lot. It's it's not cheap. No. There's a there's a there's an application called Affinity that's essentially Photoshop, and it's a fraction of the price. You could buy it a one-time deal for like less than fifty bucks. And there's GIMP, which you can get free on the internet. I mean, there's like there are endless variations on this stuff. So that, again, that's why I didn't want to get into the nuts and bolts. Um, you, it's valuable to have photo editing software, for yeah. sure. Uh, you probably see me taking photos at meetings for the last couple of years. And you might have, if you've gotten here early, you've seen me walking around the room with this thing. This is a uh, 18 percent gray Just what you were talking. standard color correction thing. The problem with this room is we've got different light right. sources all over the place That's in different yeah. color. Yeah. Whether you're on the lathe or down here or up there in our little photo booth um, sort of thing. So I just walk around with this and take pictures of this. And then when I get home, I use Lightroom. But most of the photo apps that I've seen use a similar kind of thing, an eyedrop thing. You just click it on here, and all of a sudden, boom, the color is correct. Mm -hmm. And it's very dramatic to see that. You can see that. Yeah, that's cool. That's really easy to do. This was like 25 bucks. Excellent. OK. So um, I always duplicate my, my the original photo. I duplicate it, so I've got it as a background layer. So basically, I've got two photos in stack in one. So if I screw things up horribly, I can just chuck it, and I still have the original photo untouched, and I can start again. Okay, so that's an important piece. Um, I use the healing brush to remove unnoticed blemishes. Now, I want to talk about photo ethics. I am not changing my piece. I'm not improving my work. I'm getting rid of things that are not my work. Right, so, so that's the ethical line that, that, I, that I adhere to. Um, I would feel really bad if I had a crack and I photoshopped out the crack and I sold it to somebody and they said, hey, the picture didn't show this crack. That I'm not going to remove flaws in the piece. I'm getting rid of dust or dirt or lint or stuff like that that are not part of the piece. Um, but it's invaluable being able to do that because something will always creep in that you want to get rid of. Um, I use the unsharp filter which is really valuable, and I don't know how to explain it, but it, it helps to sort of just crisp things up. Um, again, I don't feel like that's unethical because it's a function of the electronics and the computer, not a function of the quality of the work itself. Um, I, I, I look at the contrast and see if I need to adjust that a little bit, and then I save it, and if I need to, I resize it as I'm saving it because putting some of the stuff on the web, you don't want giant files, but it's good to have a giant file for if you ever do print it or anything like that. So really, folks, like I said, I'm not a professional photographer, and I don't play one on TV. Uh, clearly, clearly, there are people here who are, have this stuff in better control than I do, but I'm able to get photos that I don't apologize for. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, been, I've been accepted into art shows, I've got stuff in artistry and wood, I and I feel absolutely confident in the quality of my photographs because this is enough. It's enough. It's, it's not pro level, it's enough. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so more details, you want your, your monitor calibrated, you need some editing software, it's good to know how to work with layers, 
You want to zoom in and out relentlessly to find those little things and then correct them and then come back out and find the next one and go in. And you, you, you need a really fluid workflow. Um, you, you want to save and you want to like what you do with the dropper. Like I've kept track sometimes of color balance of this number, contrast of this number, so I can just recreate it. Um, if you're smart, you learn how to save stuff in the computer. Um, and the other thing is be patient. Don't just finish the photo and stick it up where someone's going to see it. Come back to it and look at it again and make sure. And I think that's it. And I told you about that. And that's that. So I'm happy to answer any questions. If you want to see my work, it's steveforcewoodturning.com. And I'm on Instagram. So thank you all for putting up with me and all this, all of this. Oh, and this is this gets auctioned off or whatever. This is for you guys. Well, wow. so. Thank you.